All right, last time we had class, seems like a long time ago, uh, we discussed the, uh, uh, the uh, beginnings of the Reformation and really some of the major events that were leading up <clears throat> into the Reformation. Um, what are some of those, I believe it's five things that we looked at, um, five events um, that uh, brought Europe to the eve of the Reformation. There we go. The corruption in Rome. Rome was very corrupted. Uh, we're going to see that show up again today um, with some of the reformers that we're going to be looking at today and what they said about Rome. Um, anyone else? Anything else? The what? The printing press. Um, remember I used the example of going from uh, just in my lifetime, <clears throat> before the days of computers, and now we think of tweeting instantly. Millions of people know what you're thinking. Um, it's pretty amazing. And that's what the printing press was to their era. Uh, they had a hard time reproducing anything and getting word out. All of a sudden, they can print it and print thousands of copies, and he got it out. Boy, that's just an amazing accomplishment. And that brought people to some light, to some understanding. So the printing press was another very important factor. Anybody else? You're looking at your notes. You might as well, Caleb. The Renaissance. The Renaissance? What was that? Um, just knowledge and exposure to knowledge and learning. Sure. A desire for learning. A desire to learn new things. And people became dissatisfied with what had been happening for the last thousand years. <laughs> So that's an important factor. The economic factors that uh, the society, the societal concept of feudalism was on the decline. And so people moved out of the poor classes and began to want more things. People have always wanted more things, but they weren't satisfied with that concept anymore. The preaching of the Lollards and many other groups, um, that was another big factor in the Reformation. And then, of course, God's sovereign working, <clears throat> that it was time, God's timing. Um, he knows and has control of the times and the seasons. Okay, we're going to look today at some of the, doc the, the denominations that came out of the Reformation. And so, of course, this fits, if you're in my denominations class, we're going to just do an overview. But this is, this is what we deal with in denominations class. Uh, primarily, there's others as well that we fit in there that came along later on, but many of them came during this Protestant Reformation, uh, those protesting against the Catholic Church. And so we're going to see these Reformation denominations. We're going to look at a few today, and then in our next class period, we'll look at a few more as well. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Help us as we uh, study and learn these things today, God, that we'd be thankful for our own heritage, thankful for those who came before us and just preached and believed the Bible and stuck to the truth. We ask that you help us to do the same and pass that on to our children someday. We ask that you bless our day now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to start, of course, with the first and the main protester against the Catholic Church, and that is Martin Luther and the Lutheran denomination. Um, there are, as the book tells us, four main denominations that came out of the Reformation. There's four main denominations, page 220 in your book, if you want to follow along there. <clears throat> There's the Lutheran, started by Martin Luther. Of course, he's considered to be one of the uh, first to really take a strong stand against the, the Pope, who was successful. Uh, there were others who had also taken a good, strong stand before him. John Wycliffe was one and many others. But... Um, he was successful, Martin Luther. Then there's the Anglicans. That's the Church of England. That's another denomination that came out of the Catholics. Protested against the Catholics, but not for good reason. Can you remember why they protested the Catholics? <laughs> King Henry VIII wanted a divorce uh, from his wife, and so he uh, decided to make his own denomination, his own church. The Presbyterians, they also came out of the uh, Catholics. And the Presbyterian always think of them, I always think of them as dead and dry. And if you think about their theology, 
and the Reformed theology. That would be John Calvin, the Arminians. That would be all the Reformed groups. Uh, the Church of Scotland, the D Dutch Reformed, uh, uh, on and on. They're, you know, they're all this strain of uh, protesting the Catholic Church, this denomination. And then there are those who came out of that, the Church of England especially, out of one of the other ones, and that is the Methodist denomination. That was, as we talked about in our denominations class just last week. Uh, but they came out of, pretty much out of the Anglican Church, out of the Catholic Church. So uh, we're going to deal with a couple of these today. We're going to start with Lutheran first, Martin Luther. Um, we, uh, you can look at some of the things about uh, his life. There's plenty of information. Anybody want to do Martin Luther, by the way? I kind of do. Kind of? So that'd be a great one. Think about that. Think about, don't focus your paper on his early life as much. You can bring that out to support the rest of it, you know, to say he was a monk, he was a Catholic. But then see if you can come to some conclusions about what he believed. So that'd be very interesting. <clears throat> Number three, there he became uh, part of the faculty of the University of Wittenberg in 1511, the head of the theology department. And he was teaching through the Book of Romans when he realized that the Book of Romans says things that are different than the Catholic Church. And that could be a problem, right? Uh, the sale of papal indulgences brought about Luther's break with Rome. They had been selling indulgences for years, but this particular time. They were selling them at a discounted rate, <laughs> if you will. Selling forgiveness of sins. And of course, how do you sell forgiveness of sins? By selling something that the people are convinced they need and uh, that'll buy them somehow forgiveness. The Pope was financing his own luxurious lifestyle and extravagant plans. For example, completing the cathedral of St. Peter in Rome. And so he literally sent out salesmen. That's the way you want to think of it. Salesmen, representatives of the church to promote the sale of indulgences. All right, so uh, the bigger the sin, the more you had to buy to forgive your sin. So as uh, Martin Luther recognized, people who had money were openly going into sin and then they would just buy an indulgence and they thought that everything was taken care of. People were, and this is where Martin Luther realized, people were skipping church. People were not coming to church, not coming to the mass. And then they excused it by saying that they had an indulgence for that. Um, you know, it'd be like if in the dorm you just stop doing your dorm jobs because you have some kind of payoff for me. Might think about that, by the way. Um, I take uh, gold coins. <laughs> it costs a little bit more, you know, for big sins. Um, anyway, so, but, but they were literally uh, excusing their sin and just openly, brazenly committing sin and excusing it by saying they had an indulgence for that. So it must have been nice to have these kinds of things. Think about, you know, there's no thought here of what God says. There's no thought of what the Bible says. It's just what the church says. And when, the ch when you've developed this dependence on the church for hundreds and even a thousand years, people just believe what the church says, and as ludicrous as it sounds, and especially nowadays. So one of the Pope's agents, John Tetzel, came to towns near where Luther was living. And he comes into town, he's sitting on a chariot, he's holding a red cross in his hand, he has a velvet cushion with the order from the Pope, and he's selling these indulgences. If you can imagine 500 years ago, the pomp and circumstance coming into town, selling something from the Pope. Here's literally his pitch. We know what he said. And things like this were said. Let's read this. There is no sin so great that an indulgence cannot remit. But more than this, indulgences avail not only for the living, but for the dead. Priest, noble, merchant, wife, youth, maiden. Do you not hear your parents and your other friends who are dead and who cry from the bottom of the abyss? 
Why, the very instant your money rattles at the bottom of the chest, the soul escapes from purgatory and flies liberated to heaven. I mean, I'm almost convinced. You know, to <laughs> rattle that money in there. Wow. I mean, it's nothing like Jesus and the poor widow's might. <laughs> Um, there's quite, quite a difference. So the sale of indulgences brought a fortune in the Pope's coffers, but the people's morals suffered as a result. So on October 31st, Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the Castle Church at Wittenberg. And in the spring of the next year, he was called to defend his position before an assembly of monks in Heidelberg, Germany. All right, the Pope got directly involved with this. Uh, he wrote to Frederick, uh, the, uh, a position in Saxony, asked him to turn Luther over to the Cardinal, but Frederick refused to do so. So that's a very important thing. Um, Frederick instead had Luther kidnapped. Um, anyway, we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but... Uh, let's see here. Frederick refused to turn him over. Luther then was, uh, there were all kinds of writing put out and pub uh, pamphlets published about him and distributed, denouncing him. And what did he do? Instead, he goes out and puts out his own information. And so again, we see the printing press uh, carrying the word out. Remember the internet example. There it is again. Um, the internet, for a long time, the, mass, the major news networks had a stranglehold on news. Then the internet came about and, of course, uh, put out all this word and, of course, talk radio and all these other things. But when you have alternatives uh, and another option, and that's what Luther had, he put out his own writings, own paperwork. On page 224, the emperor issued a judgment against Luther and forbade him to continue to speak or write. And they had a plan, the Catholics did, to assassinate him. And so Frederick, quote-unquote, kidnapped him uh, by his own men, disguised as bandits, and carried him off to the castle of Wartburg to protect him. About, uh, let's see here, what year was that? I'm thinking it was like 1518. I believe it was several years later where he finally came back to Wittenberg and um, he had a following, um, had a number of others who obviously agreed with him. Number 16 on page 225, one name you'll want to know, Philip Melanchthon. He was a professor at the university, and uh, he was a writer, as Luther was, and so he helped organize the, the writings, the, the, um, the statement of faith, for Luther's denomination. Philip Melanchthon, a very important name in uh, Lutheran history as well, Lutheran denomination. By 1529, and this is a very significant meeting of the Catholics, in 1529, there was a group of uh, Catholics who condemned the Lutheran movement and forbade them to spread their false teaching, their teaching. And so many of the German princes around there protested against this, and as a result, they were called the Protestants, the protesters. And so that is really the beginning of what's now known as the Protestant Reformation by name. Okay, um... They spread. Lutheran de uh, denomination became a very prominent, even comparable in Germany and certain countries, comparable to the Catholic Church. Okay, so uh, let me just mention a couple things here as far as their doctrine. You can get a whole lot more things in denominations class, and hopefully you've remembered those of you in my class. Hopefully you'll remember some of those things. Point out a couple things about Luther and his doctrine. He uh, retained infant baptism. Luther still, uh, as far as we know, all through his life, he retained infant baptism. Uh, he defended it. He persecuted Baptists over this issue of infant baptism, Anabaptists. 
<coughs> and so to this day, uh, the Lutheran denomination still puts a lot of emphasis on, Luther on infant baptism and baptism for salvation. He also retained the priesthood. <coughs> he kept the priesthood. The Lutheran priests, they don't practice transubstantiation where they literally believe it becomes the body and the blood of Christ, but they practice what's called consubstantiation alongside con, uh, that the the... Lord's Supper, it doesn't literally become, but it's just His presence is in there and all around it. Consubstantiation. He also retained a form of the Catholic Mass. The Sacrament of the Altar. The Sacrament of the Altar. That's what he called it. And so this is what's known as consubstantiation that uh, the Mass, it is, it's right around there. The, the presence of God is all in and around the Mass. And of course, that also is ridiculous. <clears throat> he also retained the state church idea. Uh, this is a, you know, I don't blame him for this personally, because this is all they knew. Um, instead of separating completely and saying, you know, if you want your freedom of religion to have any kind of church you want, that's fine. Of course, that would later become a very popular idea and popularized by America. But uh, he developed and continued this state church idea. And so Lutheranism became the state religion of Germany, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Prussia, Iceland, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Many countries had this as their state religion. And so I don't know. Personally, I don't blame them for this. Uh, this is just what they knew. This is what you do. You know, when you leave the Catholic Church, you put in a different church as the head with the government. Okay? <clears throat> so, he uh, definitely protected and believed in the idea of the state church. They persecuted and tormented Anabaptists and other non-Lutherans as well. And so, again, pulled out of the Catholic Church, and as, what was it, the Puritans said about the Anglican Church, that there are still many rags of the popery. And it's exactly what we find here. All these things are Catholic. State Church, the Mass, the, the um, priesthood, and then uh, infant baptism. All of these still are Catholic uh, doctrines. Okay, so I, I like Martin Luther. He didn't do nearly as much as he should have. But uh, I, when I think of the chains of the Catholic Church being wrapped around all of Europe, Martin Luther broke those chains. And a lot of help from before him, but he broke those chains. So, <clears throat> all right, the next group that we want to look at then is the Reformed churches. The Reformed churches. These are the Presbyterian churches, the Calvinist churches. There's lots of names for these. <laughs> Um, and when you hear these terms, don't, don't be too wrapped up in the term, okay? Um, for example, uh, th there's a kind of a slight difference between Calvinists and hyper-Calvinists. So, a Calvinist today would believe in these uh, five points of Calvinism kind of loosely, but a, what we today call a hyper-Calvinist is somebody who says, you know, you two over there, God made you to destroy you in hell. And the rest of you, he made you to save you. You don't have a choice in that. It's completely, one. it's totally up to God, completely 100%. There's no will or choice that a man makes in the slightest. And so that's what we today call a hyper-Calvinist. Now, I personally don't think, now this is my personal opinion, you'll read people who disagree, maybe you disagree with me, I don't know. But I personally don't think that John Calvin was quite as strong as what sometimes on some of those kinds of issues as he's portrayed to be. That's my personal opinion. But regardless, what he did and what he taught definitely led to that whether he realized it or not. Um, <sighs> Calvinism. It's, it's, a, it's a theology that's designed to understand systematically the doctrines of the Bible. 
Okay, now you say, well, oh, that's good. Well, yes, it is good to, you know, we have a class called Systematic Theology. And we try to understand the doctrine of man, the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of Jesus Christ and who he is, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of the, the, the end times. So we systematically try to understand these things. But I think it's also important to understand that there are some things about God that you never can understand. Humanly speaking, it's impossible. Um, the Trinity. Okay, I, don't, I can't even wrap my mind around the Trinity. I can't wrap my mind around why Jesus, why God was interested so much in the world to give His Son, His beloved firstborn Son, in, in a sacrifice for us. That, that doesn't make any sense. Um... I don't understand, as Calvinism, one of their main points is, I don't understand why God can, um, why God can save us, and it's His work that saves us, but yet He gives us a choice. And He gives us a free will to choose, but at the same time, He's also doing the, I believe, according to Ephesians chapter 2, that God must wake the heart. God, if, whatever you want to call it, God must convict there's a jolt of life that God has to give before a person can respond. So, I don't understand all those things. And I don't think it's necessarily intended for us to understand. So, here's the way I, I think Calvinism really goes to the extreme away from the Catholics. Think about what the Catholics said. You have to do this and do that and do this and do that and do this and do that. Salvation is totally up to me. So what did Calvinism do? They went to the other extreme. They said, no, salvation is not up to me at all. Salvation is totally up to God. <laughs> you see what they did? So they, they're trying to explain, from a human perspective, explain and understand everything about God. And they really oversimplify salvation. They oversimplify the nature of God and the Bible says his ways are above our ways and his thoughts higher than our you know they try to completely in detail systematically understand everything about God and salvation and his work and his grace and his redemption and easily oh yeah they just open it up and ease, easily explain all of that and I don't buy that the Bible says that his ways are above our ways so, Calvinism is a response, it's a reaction, I think, to the Catholic Church. It's not anything of us, it's all of God. And it's also man in his pride trying to understand and know everything about God and just easily explain it. And it's not that way at all. But I believe that point is very... Uh, is demonstrated in a lot of ways, by the types of people today that believe in Reformed theology. Um, it's almost always, it's really smart people. John Calvin was very, very smart. It's the really smart people who try to understand all of this stuff, and they come to their conclusions where they try to understand everything about it, and it's not meant for us to understand some of these things. Anybody, any thoughts on that? You're looking at me. I think, anyway, any questions on that? Everybody understand what I'm talking about here? So, so we call it lots of names. Calvinism, hyper-Calvinism is another, today it's a more modern term. Um, Reformed theology, uh, it's called, uh, well, I already mentioned Calvinism. Um, then the opposite side of that, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is Arminianism. That's kind of the opposite side. It's not the opposite side. But it's kind of considered to be the opposite side of Calvinism. Um, so there's a number of names that are involved, are connected to Calvinism, connected to Reformed theology. So let's talk about these. Uh, Zwingli first. 
Aldrich Zwingli. You'll see lots of different spellings on his name. But he was a Reformation leader in Zurich, Switzerland. He was a Catholic priest. He rejected the Pope eventually and was, was, became a married man, which of course means he couldn't be a Catholic priest anymore. How did this happen? Through study of the Bible. He, be, he got a copy of the Greek New Testament that Erasmus had published. How was that published? The printing press, right? So there it is again. <clears throat> so he preached against Rome. city of Zurich followed his leadership, and they all rejected Catholicism. And so he made his church, his own church, the secular government, tied them together, state church. So, Zwingli persecuted the Anabaptists. War broke out between the Catholics and the Reformers. Switzerland was then divided into 13 states, or cantons. Some of the cantons were Protestant, some of them were Catholic. So we see that in Switzerland, this divided uh, state churches. Um, so Zwingli was certainly one of these. Uh, he had some right ideas. He definitely took, cause, took a stand against the Catholic Church. But we'll see some more about him later uh, when Calvin comes to Switzerland. John Calvin, of course, is the most prominent name in the his history of uh, Presbyterianism, which is re Reformed theology. He was a Catholic, but he wasn't a priest. And he uh, read a lot of books and scripture and was very, very, very knowledgeable. Um, go down a ways, which by the way, I forgot to mention this earlier today. Uh, you need 500 pages of reading for uh, at the end of the semester. All of this book. So go back through and read through these things. <coughs> Excuse me. Calvin had a strong influence through his teaching and writings in those days. He has continued to have a strong influence uh, over Reformed theology. He put a book out. Um, the final one was put out in 1559 called The Institutes of the Christian Religion. The Institutes of the Christian Religion. Now, what I said about Reformed theology being taking what's, I think, in many ways, unknowable about God, what is above us, and bringing it down to where the average common person can understand God's mercy and God's grace Okay, uh, the, anyway, he tried to do that, and he was very philosophical in this book, making it understandable for anybody. And uh, he, I think, did a, did a huge disservice and made a huge error in doing this. All right, so this theology is called the TULIP theology. T-U-L-I-P. Make sure you know these if you're in denominations. You're lucky because you already have had this. Um, so let's talk about this tulip theology. Uh, T, this is a, the total depravity of man. These things are all taught in his Institutes of the Christian Religion. Total depravity of man. Man is totally depraved. Now, let me just say, all of these have some truth in them. Some. And that's the danger, you know. Um, that, I, that I think we have to be careful of. We're mixing truth and error. So, man is totally depraved. On the surface, I totally agree. Man is totally depraved. What does Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 say? And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. There's many passages of Scripture that talk about the depravity of man, but that's not what he meant. He meant that man is so totally depraved that he cannot be saved. He has nothing to do with it. In other words, he's dead. He's in a coffin. He's a dead man. And God has to come along and wake him up. So he has nothing to do with it. Well, I believe that man is dead. And I do believe that God convicts. What is conviction? It's a shock. God shocks them, us. I, I remember when I 
talked about being saved. I wanted to be, but I didn't know. I didn't think about it. I didn't really realize the consequences of not being saved. I didn't really, you know, I just wanted to be saved because my older brothers and sisters were saved. But I remember very clearly the first, I think, is the first time that I was under conviction. And I was in bed. It was after 9, 10 o'clock at night. And it hit me like a ton of bricks that I didn't know where I was going when I died. <laughs> uh, scared me to death. That's the conviction. So I was a sinner. I was totally depraved. Man is a sinner. You have the quickened and women. Just don't forget that. And you hath he quickened who were dead. Yes, we're dead. But when the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, then we have the choice. And that's what this doesn't recognize. So he believed in the total. What he meant by that is that man has nothing to do with salvation. Okay? And make sure you understand that. Total depravity of man. Secondly, the unconditional election of man. Unconditional election. <clears throat> All right, this is wrong on several fronts, but it also has a little bit of truth in it. What's the election? Well, doesn't Paul numerous times in his writings say uh, the elect? You to, I'm writing this to the elect of God. There is an election. That word is used in the New Testament. Um, we believe in that. God elects. God has elected. God and by the way, the way to understand all this, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the way to understand all of these things that seem difficult is God's foreknowledge. God elects in He chooses, He knows who will be saved. And so you're saved according to that. Again, you have to reconcile that God knows more than we do. And we can't understand all this. So the election, yes. God knows in his foreknowledge, in his in, you know, what's the, omniscience, he knows everything. But unconditional? That's totally unbiblical. Um, and without going all into all that, but you know, we can surely think of some verses, whosoever will may come. So you know how they define whosoever will? Whosoever will that has been elected may come. <laughs> No, that's not what it says. So unconditional election, unconditional is very wrong. God unconditionally chooses who will be called and who will be saved, uh, not called, who will not be saved. Um, Romans chapter 9 is a big passage on this as well, where for them, where they use that to say that Pharaoh, uh, the children of Israel, that Pharaoh's heart was hardened by God. God hardened his heart. Well, go back to Exodus, and you'll see that Pharaoh hardened his heart a bunch of times, too. Uh, so God, in his foreknowledge, knows what we'll do, and he then hardened Pharaoh's heart. He gave Pharaoh several opportunities. Titus 2.11, The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness were in us. So the word of God, the grace of God, sorry, teaches us. It shows us. It wakes us. But if somebody doesn't get saved, <clears throat> it's still on them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next, the limited atonement. The limited atonement. It means exactly what it says. That when Christ died on the cross and atoned for sin, that was not for everybody. That atonement was only for those who are elected. <clears throat> So, this limited atonement, limited to the chosen ones. What's the word that they like to use for the chosen or the elected? It starts with a P. The pre... Oh, man. The predestined. Predestination. According to, they say, according to predestination, which, by the way, the word predestined is in the Bible. Don't be afraid of it. Just read it in context. Again, I'm not going to do it here, but read it in context. Predestined. Yes, God predestines. Absolutely. But he, the Bible never says that he predestines people to hell or predestines them to heaven. He predestines 
them to life. There's other things that are, the, but all of that still, and in the context of every time the word is used, it always refers to the foreknowledge of God, that God knows. So it's not that God chooses for us. God chooses when we have already made our choice. So, But he said that the atonement of Christ, the blood of Christ, everybody that the blood of Christ was shed for will be saved. So if, if you had the blood of Christ and it was shed for you, then you'll be saved. If you're not saved, the blood of Christ was never meant for you. Okay, so there's he believed in limit atonement. Next, he also uh, believed in irresistible grace. So once the grace of God is available to you, you will be saved. You will be saved. It's overwhelming. Cannot be resisted. Then the perseverance of the saints. Now this doesn't quite mean maybe what you think. Um, the, the book says the saved will continue in the faith. What that means is that those who are saved will continue. So the opposite is also, it's implied there, that if you don't continue in the faith that you never had, you're not one of His, you're not elected, you're not chosen or called or predestined or anything like that, then if you're not living for Him, which of course that's always so random, well, what does that mean? Um, if you're not living for Him, then you never had. If you don't persevere, that you are not actually one of the chosen. Okay, um, so this is their theology, and this theology was very prevalent. By the way, we'll go back to what I said. It's a rejection of Rome saying that everything is of man, and it's a acceptance of the, the different, the opposite end of the spectrum, that it's all about God. It's nothing of us. So if you come to God and you're saved and you don't continue, you never had in the first place. It's all of God. God working through you. God does everything. And so that's also a big mistake. <clears throat> Alright, so they had their statement of faith, the Westminster Standard, Westminster Confession as it's called. Um, and uh, this, by the way, this uh, denomination spread all over Europe. And, and really, this teaching has infiltrated n numbers of denominations. Um, what is one of the byproducts? Can you tell me, can you think of one of the byproducts of this teaching here? Sorry, perseverance. Anybody want to think about some of the byproducts? If it's nothing of man and it's all of God, what does that do for their denominations? <clears throat> this is the, the most common criticism of this theology. Yes? Sure. Why would you share the gospel? Don't share the gospel with the heathen. They might not be predestined. They might not be. There's another word that also is the, the idea of ordained. God has ordained to some. To, so they think that all these words mean the same thing. And that's the way they define them. So why would you go out and tell somebody about being saved when God will already do that? That's his job. So the, what it produced was churches that began to just cave in, really. There's, they're not growing. They're not live, alive. They're not vibrant. Now, there are some preachers throughout the time since then who have held to some of these and been great soul winners. You know, they've held to, they believe in man is depraved. You know, there's, anyway, to me, the issue is not of whether you're a Calvinist or not. The issue is whether you're a Bible believer or not. So I would take the grains of truth from the Bible and say, okay, they're kind of right there, but I'm not bound to these at all. I'm just, I'm just bound to the Bible. I'll give you an example. People say that Charles Spurgeon was a Calvinist. 
because of some things that he said about the sovereignty of God. Well, I know by his practice he was not a Calvinist as, we, as this is defined. So call him a Calvinist if you want. He certainly wasn't a hyper-Calvinist who didn't do anything. You know, they called his church the soul trap. <laughs> you go to his church, you're going to get saved because you're going to come under such conviction. Okay, that, that doesn't, that's not fitting of Calvinism. But yet he believed in the sovereignty of God. Well, I know why I believe the sovereignty of God, because it's in the Bible. <laughs> I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe in the depravity of man. I believe, but not the way he defines them. When I say I believe in the sovereignty of God, I believe that God is in control of everything. Absolutely. He's so in control of everything that he's not afraid to let me choose things and still know what I'm going to do before I do it. So I, I, I trust, you know, that's the great thing about the sovereignty of God. Um, when he lets things happen to us, we say, hey, I don't know why that happened. I know he's in control, though. And lo and behold, 30 years later, you might find out why something happened. You might never find out why it happened. So God's in control. The sovereignty of God. Anyway, why did, why did Charles Spurgeon still continue to be aggressive for souls if he's a Calvinist? Anyway, he, he wasn't. So... When people throw names around like this and they say, this guy was this, well, uh, he, he's been dead for 150 years. I can't ask him what he actually believes. So don't just buy that. If somebody calls you a Calvinist or calls you a whatever, you know, are you for or against? I don't know. They're not alive. I can't talk to them and ask them. Um, I just believe the Bible. Was he right when he said this? Maybe. But that doesn't mean I'm, I believe in everything he said. I don't believe in everything I say. <laughs> um, so why would I believe in everything that somebody who's been dead for 150 years has written in a book? You understand what I'm saying? So uh, anyway, I just don't, I don't like to get caught up in all of this stuff too much. Do you, are you this or that? Do you believe? No, they're all made mistakes. So did, you know, so does Pastor Dameron. Everybody has some flaws, and, and you look at it and follow the Bible for yourself. Um, no, I don't, that's not an excuse for you to say, well, you know, I'm not going to listen to Pastor David then. No, he's the man of God here. And your pastor is the man of God at your church. Follow him. But that doesn't mean they're perfect. And if they write, and if they have lots of books published and so on, even then it doesn't mean they're perfect. You compare it to the Bible, and is it, is it, is it good and right? Um, anyway, in all our books in the library, we have a disclaimer at the front. Didn't you used to work in the library? You still do? Mm -hmm. So we have a disclaimer in the front of every book that just because we have this book in the library doesn't mean we believe everything it says. So, okay. That's, I'm, I got off into preaching and not teaching. <laughs> so what time do we have here? 1040. Okay, <clears throat> so there's a reaction then to Calvinism, and it's called Arminianism. Page 235, James Arminius. He rejected some of the, the stronger points of Calvin's teaching. He said, we're going to base our views strictly on the Bible, and he didn't like error. He had good intentions. He had a lot of right things, I personally believe. Uh, he debated philosophers and teachers, followers of Calvin and others. He was willing to pursue doctrinal controversy, the mean spiritedness and petty jealousy that often characterize his opponents. He was not like that. So Arminius had a lot of good points. Did he have flaws? Certainly. <laughs> um, he wanted his students to turn to the Bible alone. Well, that's good. You know, and of course, he wasn't perfect, but his zeal for truth won him many enemies. Uh, they attempted to disrupt his ministry. So when he traveled to Rome, rumors were spread that he had kissed the Pope's slipper and become a Catholic secretly. 
Well, when he came back, he totally denounced the Pope. He said, I saw at Rome a mystery of iniquity much more foul than I'd ever imagined. <laughs> um, he didn't kiss the Pope's slipper. He didn't become a Catholic. Uh, he was charged with having other false doctrines, Pelagianism and other things. And uh, I don't personally believe that those things were true of him. I think he was a, a, a good, decent, honorable man who was still wrong in some things. Um, I give him, I guess, a benefit of the doubt, if you will. Um, he, he didn't know all that we know. He didn't have the background of Baptist teaching that we, uh, that we have. Um, he didn't have Baptist distinctives like I had at Fairhaven Baptist College. Um, anyway, so, you know, I, sometimes I wonder, you know, things that we believe so strongly, you know, when we get to heaven someday, maybe it'll be, or 300 years from now, somebody will observe and, you know, listen to the MP4 uh, or MP, whatever you call of my teaching and say, man, you know, he thought he was right. Anyway, we try to follow the Bible. <clears throat> try to be honest before God. So anyway, the Calvinists turned around and condemned Arminianism and the followers of James Arminius. And so pretty much anybody today uh, who disagrees with Calvin is called an Arminianist, uh, including me, including us. If you dis No, we're not Calvinists, and I'm not an Arminianist. I am... A Bible, I try to be a Bible believer. And I personally think that Arminius would have been very offended if he'd have known that his followers were called Arminius. He wanted people to believe the Bible and follow the Bible. That's my opinion. He died at a re reasonably young age. Okay, page 239. This is one group <coughs> of Protestants in France who were Calvinists. Now, as you can tell, we've covered uh, in this section. Go back here. The Lutherans and the Reformed theology. And then an uh, aspect of the Reformed is the Arminius, Arminianism. And now the Huguenots are also still under the Reformed theology. Because these are Calvinists living in France. So we haven't gotten to the other ones yet, and we'll get to them in the next class period. The Anglicans and, oh, anyway, who's the other group? The Methodists. Anyway, so we'll get to some of those others later on. Um, let's talk about the Huguenots, and these are Protestant Calvinists in France. Does that make sense? So try to keep that separate. Always remember this. You know, these are, these are godly people, as for the most part. People who were persecuted for their faith and stood for their faith. But they certainly weren't Baptists. They weren't, you know, they didn't have everything lined up like we do. Uh, we're so proud of ourselves, aren't we? Um, but they, these are good people as a whole. These are godly people. People who tried to follow the Bible and not a church, not a Catholic church at least. So, in the 1500s, the Catholic church was dominating France. The Inquisition was in full swing in France. And in spite of the Inquisition, there were large numbers of Protestants in France. Many of them educated and, and wealthy, well-to-do, hard workers. By 1559, estimated 10% of the population was Protestant. Okay, that would mean a lot of Huguenots, a lot of uh, people who stood against the Catholic Church, but did so at their own peril. In fact, of course, there were actual wars between the Catholics and Protestants in France. And so the Huguenots got involved in this as being Protestants. They were attacked by the Catholics. And so on page 240, you see some of the background for this awful massacre in 1572. It's called the Massacre of St. Bartholomew. Um, it's a, I believe it's a massacre. It's named this because of the celebration of a feast, St. Bartholomew's Day. 
anyway, so talks about uh, a little bit of the background of the Queen Catherine is what we'll call her just to keep it from getting too difficult. The leader of the Huguenots was a man named Gaspard. You help me. Gaspard. Thank you. <laughs> see, I knew I was way off. And I watched, I purposely looked up to see what you guys would say. Do, Caligny? How do you say it? C O L I G N Y. Not like Rouillard or uh, Fournier. All right. You don't speak French. Good. No, I'm kidding. My wife speaks French, so I shouldn't make fun of the French language. Hmm? She's not w good at it anymore, but she used to be. <clears throat> Yeah, she likes. She needs to work on it more. She likes to work on it. But yeah, she speaks French. <clears throat> she uh, lived in Paris for about a year when they were taking language school, and then um, they were missionaries in uh, the Ivory Coast, which is a French colony. So, yeah, see, you didn't know that. I got connections. I shouldn't brag on that, should I? <laughs> I'm kidding. <clears throat> All right, uh, so Queen Catherine, she hated the Protestants. She was a Roman Catholic. Now, the point I want to make here and the point the book tries to make is that this, is, this massacre, they, they killed about 4,000 Huguenots um, in three days. 4,000, this is all-out war. And it was orchestrated and organized by the Queen of France and the Pope of the Catholic Church. Okay? And so that's important to put that connection there together. Um, they orchestrated this massacre of thousands of Bible believers. The leader, Gaspar, however you say his name, <laughs> Uh, he was killed in his own bedroom, thrown out the, the loft, and then they purposely, they treated him like a pagan. They cut his head off, they roasted his head, and sent it to Rome to the Catholic Church. They were in on this together. This was planned out. Um, and thousands are murdered inside Paris for three days over the next two months. Thousands more murdered outside of Paris. And when the Pope got the word, Pope Gregory the 13th, he called for a celebration. Messenger who brought the news was rewarded with a thousand pieces of gold. Had all the cardinals, bishops, and monks in great pomp and circumstance, led them to the high altar to offer thanks, quote, for the great blessing which heaven vouchsafed to the Roman see and to all Christendom. Artillery thundered. Streets were uh, lighted up and the citizens were gleeful. A high mass was conducted, quote, to thank God for the slaughter of the enemies of the church lately executed in France. Yeah, that'd be men, women, and children. And the Catholic Church is orchestrating this with the pagan, with the, the government of France. Um, he had coins made uh, celebrating the deaths. So when you read Catholic encyclopedias, obviously remember this. Oh yeah, they, they got rid of, I don't forget, you know, they don't use the word exterminated the enemies, but they say something along, we eliminated the enemies of the Catholic Church. Yeah, you, you took them and you brutally butchered them, is what you did. Uh, men, women, and children who didn't cause any kind of uprising, they were just trying to believe what they believed. All right, so... In 1598, the Huguenots received some measure of liberty. And again, in 1685, they were persecuted some more. So these are Calvinist, Reformed theology, Frenchmen living in France being persecuted and massacred by the thousands at, at different times. 
Okay? So these Protestants gave a lot. Uh, it wasn't a good time to resist the Catholic Church, even during the time of the Reformation, a lot of difficulties. All right, we'll stop there and pick up in our next class period.